Hello. So we're learning today that we don't die well in America. We don't end well in America. National polls and Gallup surveys show repeatedly that we die not what we call in palliative care a good death, but a, but a bad death, marked by needless suffering. And one area that I want to talk about today that is a primary source of this suffering is the existential, spiritual, and psychological distress and suffering that many people experience as they end their lives, as we end our lives. 20 years ago, it's remarkable, the Institute of Medicine called out for a change in how we treat the dying, to change how we approach the end of life. And sadly, 20 years later in a recent study, we found that depression in the final year of life increased by 26%. Things aren't changing. Depression, hopelessness, are strong predictors for a desire for a hastened death and end-of-life patients. And depression, why is it not working? There we go. And we know that spiritual well-being can buffer against these incredible experiences of hopelessness and depression. Cicely Saunders, the co-founder of Hospice, wrote wonderfully, you can find a degree of homeless as a person, whether you get better or not, whether you are suffering or not, and I've seen people find homeless as they die. The word heal means to restore to wholeness, to make whole. And that's from the root holy, spiritually pure. And research shows that enhancing spiritual well-being again buffers against these experiences. And wholeness involves all of the human experience. It's independent of suffering. And healing is independent of cure, of dying. Even in death, we could be healed and we could become whole. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote, if you become whole again, you're healed, no matter where along the spectrum. And Viktor Frankl, the great Holocaust survivor, wrote, meaning can be found in life literally up to the last moment, up to the last breath, and the face of death. So I'm thrilled to speak with you today about some novel research that addresses and mitigates and treats this awful existential end that some people have, and that involves the use of psilocybin and government-approved psychedelic research. Now, I know I'm in San Francisco, <laughs> and I know I'm among experts <laughs> and a lot of independent researchers, so <laughs> if I get something wrong, feel free to correct me. For almost a decade, my colleagues and I at NYU, along with a team at Johns Hopkins, have been investigating the efficacy of psilocybin, the psychoactive compound in many species of mushrooms, to mitigate end-of-life suffering, this existential despair that's so crippling for so many people, and feelings of demoralization. These mushrooms have been used for millennia by indigenous cultures for insight and healing. What many people don't know, you guys know, is that from the 50s to the early 70s, there was a large body of scientific literature documenting their clinical benefits with addiction and with end-of-life distress. These are meaning-making medicines, meaning-making molecules. And what strikes me and what's remarkable is we're wired for these experiences, these incredible mystical experiences that one dose can generate. At the heart of the world religions lies this mystic core, what the great Aldous Huxley called perennial philosophy. Mystics and ordinary people for millennia have these incredible peak or mystical experiences. And we now know if we can harness them in a scientific setting, in a safe setting, we can use them to mitigate this end-of-life distress that, that is so common and as experiences of transcendence are wired in our, in our nature. And while it involves a drug psilocybin, it's not a drug study per se. It's about these experiences, again, these naturally occurring experiences throughout history that occur naturally and can be reliably generated with this incredible medicine. I'm going to read you some quotes from some people who were in our study. These are quotes about their experience with the psilocybin after their session and the months and the years after their session. All these people had cancer and some have since passed away. This changed my life, referring to her experience. 
I can't even imagine it, fear of cancer. I felt this constant state of becoming. I felt gratitude like I've never felt before in my life. I felt totally welcome. Death doesn't matter. From a person approaching death, death doesn't matter. As we just heard, life and death are a continuum. Where does one end? Where does the other begin? I'm less afraid of death. Death is part of life. No fear of recurrence. I'm a person crippled with fear. I experience that, all, that everything is eternal and that all of existence happens in every moment. And finally, everything is love. And we're going to speak about love a little later on because everyone, or most people in these experiences talk about this incredible sense of love that changes how they live in the moment and changes how they approach death. And it was quite striking to hear over and over again. So what is this mystical experience? These, these are the criteria that we use for these studies. The sense of unity, a profound sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things. Everything is one. The noetic quality, coined by William James, a profound sense of encountering ultimate reality, whatever you want to call it, or incredible ultimate knowledge. Sacredness, feelings of awe, humility, holiness, and wonder. Deeply felt positive mood, peace, love, and joy. To overwhelming degrees, people in these experiences are, are weeping from this incredible experience that they're experiencing internally. Ineffability, it's impossible to describe. Words truly fall short. Although I have to say they describe it beautifully as mystics and others have throughout the centuries. But it does seem it transcends words. And what I think is the most important feature, or likely the most important feature, is this sense of transcendence. People experience a sense of transcending past, present, and future. Space, time as we know it. I know that sounds wild. Transcending this consensus reality we share today. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote, healing is the personal experience of the transcendence of suffering. And for people in this cancer study, some approaching death, this one dose generated this experience as if they could pull the lens back on their, on their ex experience and see themselves, their suffering, their cancer, their bodies, their very existence from a much broader perspective, this timeless dimension that is remarkable. This timeless dimension can foster non-attachment to this body, to this suffering, and can cultivate a connection to something more enduring within us, what does persist? And some people report a connection to something outside ourselves. Some say even outside biology and outside consciousness. For someone who is dying and whose body is beginning to fail, this body is beginning to fail and cease to work, the insight that I'm not only this body, that I'm something more enduring, that I'm not this cancer, is a profound gift to anyone approaching death. And they report incredible experiences of gratitude, equanimity, and compassion, and a deep appreciation for being alive in the very moment they have. Albert Einstein, who I think was a modern mystic, wrote, the most beautiful and profound emotion we can experience is the sensation of the mystical. So last year, our group at NYU, with a team at Johns Hopkins as well, published findings never seen before in the history of medicine. One dose of psilocybin produced remarkable changes in anxiety and depression and other measures that I'm going to show you in a few moments. We published this December of last year. And a pioneer of, this, uh, of all this research was the wonderful Aldous Huxley. So I know you all know him. He wrote The Doors of Perception, which is about his mescaline trip back in the early 50s. Um, but Aldous Huxley went on to really explore and write about the end of life and how we treat the dying. He said the dying face, increasing pain, increasing anxiety, increasing morphine, with the ultimate disintegration of personality and the loss of the opportunity to die with dignity. This is a picture of Aldous Huxley in Los Angeles on his 1953 mescaline trip, the actual picture of his first psychedelic trip. Um, I love this photograph because it's a historic photograph, Aldous Huxley and his first psychedelic journey. But I also love it because only a classy, elegant, English literary writer will come to his first trip with a tweed jacket, <laughs> cuffed pants, classy stuff, no tie-dye stuff. This is very, uh, he, he, he dresses well for the trip. This is the room we did the studies in. People came in, we prepared them for weeks, what to expect, what possibly to expect. We gave them guidelines. 
They took the capsule, they lie down, wear eye shades and headphones to encourage them to go into their interior, to go into their internal world and be with the unfolding changes. We give them some guidelines, most important guideline, trust, trust the guides you're working with, trust the medicine, and trust consciousness, trust wisdom, and let go into the unfolding changes and experience, and be open to all that rises, even suffering. And we've seen over and over again, when people move in, even to directly into suffering, into the face of death, and some actually say they experience death, those moments become teachable moments with incredible insights. And they report incredible insights about life, death, and the nature of self. Some brief findings are anxiety and depression dropped remarkably. One day after the psilocybin session, pink is, uh, psilocybin, blue placebo, mitigated in incredible ways, sustained at the six-month marker and was still following them. Depression, again, dropped remarkably versus the, the placebo. It improved spiritual well-being. Remarkably, demoralization and hopelessness, two awful experiences linked with end-of-life suffering, were dramatically reduced in the weeks following the one psilocybin-generated mystical experience. People experienced a transcendence of death defined as connecting with something more enduring than death itself. And you see again the pink being the psilocybin and the blue being placebo. Incredible experiences to see. And so many people spoke about love, which was remarkable. They spoke about a love and kindness towards themselves as they approached the end of their lives. They spoke about a love towards other people in their life and throughout their lifespan. And they spoke of what I just find stunning, this incredible, larger, broader kind of cosmic love that love is the ground of all being. I like to use the Greek word agape, of kind of almost like a divine love. I want to read to you a quote from one of the patients. I'll need these to see. His name was Patrick. He was in his 50s. He had an awful metastatic cancer. He passed away a year and a half after the study was over. I had the complete privilege to work with him. He was an incredible, incredible person. And he, just, he wrote this about his experience that day on the couch for three or four hours in this altered state of consciousness. He wrote later, from here on, love is the only consideration. Everything that happened, anything and everything that was seen and heard centered on love. It was and is the only purpose. It was so pure, the sheer joy was indescribable and the bliss. And in fact, there were no words to accurately capture my experience, my state or this place. I know I've had no earthly pleasure that's come close to this incredible feeling, no sensation, no image of beauty, nothing during my time on earth has felt as pure and joyful and glorious as the height of this journey. And he had a great life. He was a journalist, a musician, he owned restaurants, he had a great full life. I took a tour of my lungs, he wrote. So in his, in, his, in his experience, he went into his body for part of it and could see the tumors. He wrote, there were nodules there, but they seemed rather unimportant. I was being informed to not worry about the cancer. It's minor in the scheme of things. The more important work is love. My life has changed in ways I may never fully understand. But I now have an understanding and an awareness that goes beyond intellect. That my life, that every life, that all that is the universe equals one thing, love. Patrick rated this experience as the single most spiritually significant experience of his lifetime. And among the top five most meaningful experiences of his lifetime. Thich Nhat Hanh, the Zen monk, wrote, Our true nature is the nature of no birth and no death. Only when we touch our true nature can we transcend the fear of non-being or of annihilation. Sorry. Is that what these people are experiencing? Sure sounds like it. We're currently on track to do another clinical trial with psilocybin. And if that one mirrors the results of this incredible study, I think we're on track in the next coming years to have psilocybin rescheduled for people at the end of life who are suffering. And that would be a remarkable advancement in how we treat the end of life. Dying has become medicalized and needs to be humanized from behind closed doors back into the culture where it is, because death is here every day. And the implications are incredible, proving how we die with peace and dignity. It provides clues as to what is consciousness, where is consciousness? Are we wired for meaning, and if so, why? Many people here say it's because of love, and that's the enduring element. There are pro-social implications. People report we're all connected. It's an illusion that we're separate. 
And if that's true, how do we hurt one another? In closing, when Patrick had that session that day, he took the capsule, he lay down on the couch, and for two hours said nothing, and we're right there, the guys are with the person as you watch him, eye shades, headphones, and they lay quiet for five or six hours while the experience happens internally. And two hours after it began, with tears coming down his face, he said, birth and death is a lot of work. And it was quite stunning. He later said that was the start of his journey within and into consciousness. And it really shaped how he died and recalibrated his death. And his wife, Lisa, and him both attributed his ending with no fear to this experience. And he didn't want to leave this incredible miracle we have when we're alive, but he wasn't afraid. Patrick and others in these studies have been the true teachers showing us what is possible, that we're wired for these incredible, meaning-making, transcendent experiences. Nature has wired us that way. And these medicines reliably generate that experience under the right conditions. And they've confirmed for me what we use in palliative care, the term we use, that a good death is indeed possible. And that maybe the ground of being, the very nature of consciousness, is something of a substance that the mystics and these people in a study describe as a type of great liberation or love. And that we're all indeed connected. And that perhaps this is our true nature. And that it's available to us all and with it, we can live well, and we can end well. When Patrick said those words, I thought of a Zen saying that is said in the, in the monasteries at the end of the day, and I want to close with this saying today. Let me respectfully remind you, life and death are of supreme importance. Time swiftly passes by, and opportunity is lost. Each of us should strive to awaken. Awaken. Take heed. So that's one of your life. Thank you.